So here we are today uh, in uh, Munich. I go uh, Delta Delta Mike. Uh, going to uh, Amsterdam uh, Schiphol. Uh, Echo uh, Hotel Alpha Mike for the uh, IKO codes. Hope everybody is uh, doing good. Everybody is uh, surviving. So yeah, here we are, stormed uh, 112 in uh, Munich. Uh, zero fuel rate, uh, we said it's gonna be a 228.8, so I can actually uh, press the button there. That's only a simulator thing, otherwise you have to obviously on the rear aircraft into it manually. And uh, set it, so 228.8 and 245.8 for the takeoff weight minus a bit of taxi fuel. That's more or less what I was uh, expecting, so that's good. Then on the assumed temperature, um, it's uh, 63 degrees. So I only take uh, the uh, assume and I don't do any uh, reduction um, on the takeoff because in the uh, performance uh, tool I have, uh, I don't. Uh, we don't uh, reduce the thrust. So here we are. Just uh, do an assume. Uh, then go to flaps. Uh, no, sorry. First, the uh, engine height acceleration height is 1000. Yeah, that's standard. And 3000 and 1500. Uh, then flaps is 15. CG. Uh, we said it was forward 21%. So that's uh, set. And the speeds. It's actually telling me uh, for the real thing, if I was to do that in the real aircraft, 147, uh, 150, and uh, 154. So not uh, too far off actually. Once again, I'm, right I'm being a little bit uh, pedantic there with the speeds, uh, but they're actually quite close to what uh, PMDG is giving. So PMDG is giving something relatively decent there. So uh, V2 is 154. So we'll set down the speed window there for the V2. 154. Arm LNAV and VNAV to follow the uh, lateral and vertical uh, profile of the of the SID, the standard instrument departure. Uh, the track is the uh, runway track 082. Uh, I believe it's uh, flyable 70 there. That's it. Uh, I'll start the APU. Try to be good uh, neighbors, not to make too much noise, reduce the uh, emissions as well. <laughs> Hello. Uh, with the crosswind, um, it's a little bit of both actually on the on the control column and also with the rudder. Um, actually, uh, the the rudder is really. Uh, it's the only time really uh, when you would use the, the rudder is uh, is for uh, is for crosswind or otherwise for an engine failure, but otherwise the rudder is not really used uh, during the during the flight. Or it's uh, it's highly uh, not recommended to uh, to use the rudder apart from uh, yeah crosswind to kind of uh, remove the crab or otherwise for an engine failure, obviously to control the the U after the uh, the engine failure but uh, otherwise uh, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't use the rudder and for example on a crosswind or landing or even on a takeoff you're actually uh, supposed to uh, use both in um, in coordination so both the rudder and the uh, the ailerons so obviously the ailerons is with the um, all right guys everyone seated we're all buttoned up and ready to go in the back thanks if you need anything, just let me know. So yeah, you use the ailerons and the rudder and coordination, and the ailerons obviously are part of the control column. So, um, so for example, on a crosswind uh, landing, then you remove the crab with the rudder, but then you have to put a bit of aileron in the opposite direction to prevent the aircraft from kind of rolling in the other direction. So. Uh, it's a bit of a coordination exercise, which I guess that's why makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, all right, so remove this one. Ground flight. Go ahead. 
Please disconnect the ground equipment. Roger. Ground flight. Go ahead. Can we pressurize the hydraulics? Roger, you're clear to pressurize the hydraulics. Before start procedure. Are we clear to pressurize? Yes. Okay. I am ready for the checklist. Before start, turn checklist. Before start checklist, flight deck door, closed and locked, MCP. Set and checked. Takeoff speeds. Set and checked. CDU preflight. Completed. 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 Trim. Set and checked. Taxi and takeoff briefing. Completed. Before start checklist complete. Start to check completed. Life has been inserted. Release parking brakes. Commencing push. All engines clear. Start at will. Start sequence is two then one. Check. Start the right engine. Starting right. So the right uh, start switch Oil comes pressure. to uh, start, like always, and the fuel uh, control switch comes to our run. Amazing engines. The start is good. Start the left engine. Starting left. Uh, thank you, uh, Strategy. Thank you very much. Oil pressure. Engine starting, the left engine. Landing lights coming on. That's parking brake. Waiting your confirmation for good engine start. Yeah, we need to. We need to wait. <laughs> we need to wait. It's something to go like, okay, yeah, good start, but. Right now the start is good because the the red line on the uh, EGT uh, gauge there is gone, so that shows you that uh, the start is uh, finished. Obviously, uh, normal uh, parameters, and also you can uh, hear in the background the uh, the start switch uh, clicks back to the normal position. So. Uh, yes, uh, confirm. Yeah, we have two good starts, you are clear to disconnect, see you on the left with the pin, bye bye. Flaps 15. Flaps 15. Thank you again, uh, Strato, I appreciate it, thanks. 
unlocking gear. We'll do the flight control check. Tow truck disconnected. Flight has been removed. You can see on the flight control page that the uh, controls move. Then, yeah, it's still connected here. The tug is uh, driving away, and the engineer should turn around, show the pin, and kind of wave goodbye. Left is clear, right is clear. Yeah, here is he's waving. Must have some sort of uh, Bluetooth. Uh, a headset or something because he's a little bit far to uh, to still be able to to speak normally i would still be connected and say okay i'm disconnecting goodbye and then uh, remove the jack from the from the plug so to speak and kind of walk away and then do what he's done there uh waving goodbye and show the pin uh, but uh, not speak and kind of be heard from from that distance it's, uh, <laughs> it's a little thing and then we can check the the rudder again uh, right and uh, left and back to center and uh, we all set here uh, Jimmy actually I can uh, start the left or the right first um, I'm kind of sometimes do it uh, both ways so start the right first and then the left or vice versa the left and then the right so um, depends also on the direction of the push sometimes or if um, yeah uh, some places uh, they want you maybe to start uh, the the left engine if um, if you've got like stands behind um, to push and start the left engine first um, early on on the push or when you turn uh, to face uh, uh, the nose to the right if you start the left engine first you kind of uh, your uh, blast from the engine is kind of uh, protected by the aircraft itself if, 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 if you see what I mean whereas like uh, the right engine blast would affect the stance behind or so yeah it doesn't have to be the right engine all the time it can be the it can be the left first as well before taxi checklist before taxi checklist anti-ice auto recall checked flight controls checked ground equipment clear before taxi checklist complete right so we'll go here on uh, Bravo 3 Runway entry procedure. Check. Clear on the approach. Approaching zero eight right. Right, let's go. On runway zero eight right. Alright. We 
it to about 55 percent take off check thrust ref check thrust set Eighty knots. Hold. Check. V one. Rotate. Positive climb. Gear up. Gear up. Four hundred feet. Thrust ref. Check. Enough speed. Climb. The good thing is that it's not leveled at uh, 1900, so that's good. I don't know what the flight director is doing. to buy it check flaps 5 speed check flaps 5 flaps 1 speed check flaps 1 flaps up speed check flaps up After takeoff checklist. After takeoff checklist. After takeoff checklist complete. Transition altitude altimeter standard. Transition altitude altimeter standard. The, uh, the prompt doesn't matter. Uh, no, when you uh, when you return the thrust uh, for landing, um, uh, yeah, you have to kind of uh, shift your uh, uh, your vision uh, further down the runway. When you uh, when you're on the approach, you're kind of looking at the instruments and looking at your aiming point on the on the first. Uh, Part of the runway near the, the threshold, um, but uh, when you initiate the flare, and then or even a little bit before, then you have to start looking further away. And during the flare, definitely uh, kind of look uh, well outside and quite far uh, down uh, the runway uh, to to help judge with the flare. So you can't uh, like keep uh, focusing on the uh, on the aiming point. Uh, then uh, you have to transition to a flight uh, level 100 to an area further down uh, the the runway to help with the with the flare. Seatbelt sign auto. Seatbelt signs auto. So here we are, climbing away. There's a bit of a cloud layer on there, but now it's all clear. Right 
wing, the left wing, the other belly, it's quite noisy actually. Side. The usual uh, KLM uh, blue uh, along with the uh, orange. It's quite nice. Right, so that's the uh, Input that's already almost the end of the of the SID, and we are at uh, ID flight level one six zero almost, so it's climbing well. Yeah, you do look at the the puppy lights as well and the glide slope. If the the glide slope and the puppy lights are first of all situated on the more or less at the same location. And the puppy lights and the glide slope are indicating the same uh, glide path angle. So most of the time, three degrees. If the puppy is three degrees and the glide slope is uh, three degrees, then pretty much all the way down the approach uh, on the ILS, for example, uh, you would get uh, two uh, two whites, two uh, two reds on the puppy, and obviously you would be on the glide slope all the way down. Um, and the last maybe 100 feet, uh, the puppy might not be exactly the same as the uh, as the glide slope. But you would tend to kind of fly the glide slope unless there's an issue with the glide slope. And some places maybe the glide slope is has got a little particularity. Or but if everything is pretty much standard, then you can happily follow the glide slope to a 50 feet. After 50 feet, the glide slope disappears. So. Uh, you don't really rely on the glide slope anymore, but um, yeah. But generally speaking, if you're on the approach from 10 miles out, you should be on, uh, and you're on the glide slope, then you should be on two whites, two red, pretty much all the way down. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, correct, fact pilot. At night, sometimes it's uh, at night, and when it's wet, and if it's raining a little bit, uh, then the lights you don't see them very well because there's a lot of uh, moisture on the on the flight deck window, even with the wipers. Uh, sometimes it's uh, it's not very easy. Actually, the last flight I did, uh, well, we're not expecting rain on the arrival, and we got rain, and actually low lying cloud, and we got like um, the weather was supposed to be. Uh, was to be uh, supposed to be quite good and gone to the approach you could see the uh, the airport okay that's fine and uh, then further down the approach like starting to be in the in the low lying cloud and it's like oh okay 1000 and uh, still nothing like there's like this kind of low lying cloud uh, layer of cloud uh, 700 yeah still nothing 600 still nothing uh, it's like Man, this was supposed to be good weather, and uh, 500, and just starting to see the runway. Four, five, three, two, and then minimums. Yeah, okay, the runway is here, but for a long time, you know, you couldn't see the, we couldn't see the runway, and we're like, man, what is this? You know, the the, the weather was not reported as bad as that. Uh, so when you don't expect it, it kind of takes you a little bit uh, uh, by surprise, you know. Uh, Yeah, the um, the way the aircraft uh, would land automatically, I, I, I think it does take into account uh, the radio altimeter to uh, to help with the with the flare. Uh, after 50 feet, I don't think with the, with the descent it still uses the glide slope. I think then it's a matter of you know uh, starting to flare and uh, then using the the radio altimeter i always tend to to say like radar but it's not radar altimeter it's the radio altimeter uh, because it's based on a radio signal um, so yeah i would use the radio altimeter to help with the with the flare and then 
uh, land. The flare mode enunciates at uh, 50 feet roughly, and uh, and then obviously the tracking of the center line will be with the localizer, which it kind of keeps until uh, two feet. I think two feet before um, landing, you get the the rollout mode. So 50 feet is uh, flare. 30 feet is uh, idle, so it comes back on the thrust a little bit because obviously the thrust needs to come back. And uh, just before touchdown at two feet, if I'm correct, then the rollout mode engages and the uh, autopilot tracks the runway center line uh, with the help of the localizer. So that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, auto land kind of uh, functions. It's very uh, spectacular to uh, to land in uh, actual fog, uh, and you've got uh, three, four hundred meters of fog. So there's still a little bit of margin on on what the aircraft and the regulations uh, allow you to do. But uh, if you land in uh, three, four, five hundred meters of fog, there's you, you don't see much, and it's uh, always uh, spectacular to actually land in these uh, in these conditions. Uh, particularly at night. Last time I did it was actually last uh, uh, about a year ago, maybe. So we don't really do it very often, to be honest. Uh, it just depends on on your luck, so to speak, and what destinations you uh, you do. And and uh, yeah, it was quite spectacular because at night the the lights are kind of shining in the fog a little bit, so it kind of makes it a little bit even worse to to see things. And um, and yeah, it's always uh, it's always spectacular, but the aircraft does a beautiful job, so uh, you have to let it do its thing. Just monitor the systems that there's no uh, interference with the uh, ILS signals, for example, that the autopilot is not uh, there's no malfunction with the autopilot as well. Uh, so when flying a, a low vis approach like this, for us, it's more like. Uh, a matter of uh, monitoring the the systems. If there's any issues, obviously you'll get any. Uh, you'll get like a caution, um, and then most of the time, if something goes wrong, then the safest uh, course of action is to go around, of course. Uh, but uh, but nowadays the systems are very reliable. Uh, so, but yeah, it does a beautiful. Feet to level off. It does a beautiful job, actually. It's, uh, it's really nice. Yeah, and Sunstorm is not very nice as well. Yeah. I can imagine. Right, so here we are, Flyable 320. Right, so the flight was only an hour and seven minutes, I think, so it's not going to be too long before we have to go down. Uh, Strato, the uh, official uh, policy is uh, no personal uh, el electronic uh, devices in the flight deck, so I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. I think the main reason is to uh, basically avoid uh, distractions. So it's uh, it's up to uh, to people to kind of be reasonable. Uh, if uh, if you get distracted playing, I don't know, a video game on a tablet or something, and you miss uh, an important radio call for transfer, and then uh, you miss uh, a few uh, calls on the radio. And then they send you uh, uh, fighter jets to intercept or anything like that. Then 
Uh, so yeah, no, sorry, I was playing a game on my tablet. Then it's, uh, it's not gonna be good. So uh, yeah, the uh, the aim of the uh, why it's uh, prohibited is because it can uh, it can be a distraction. So they obviously uh, want to minimize the distractions. And and the cruise distractions are uh, there are plenty of distractions you can get you know. Uh, get engaged into conversation with a colleague and kind of lose track of what's going on a little bit. Uh, you can get like uh, crew members coming to visit and starting to enter like you know something a conversation and kind of get distracted. Uh, other distractions so you got to kind of uh, be careful manage other distractions maybe if like a crew member comes into the flight deck and you do get into conversation still kind of keep the headsets you know, put the headsets back on and uh, and uh, keep an eye on uh, or an ear on uh, on ATC. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's the official standard because I mean we don't blindly follow the rules. I mean, let's let's be honest. Uh, uh, but uh, but yeah. The, the rules are there for for reason, and the reason is not to be distracted. So, uh, so yeah, that's the official version, and and it's it's right in a sense, you know. It's uh, uh, as I said, it's, it's there to uh, for reason, so not to uh, create, not to have any distractions. But you can imagine when you're over an ocean and. Uh, you are in CPDLC contact. There's not much happening. Uh, the CPDLC is good actually because it makes a ding dong ding dong and you get the message and you reply to the message. So it kind of grabs the attention on the radio. It's easy. Maybe there's so much uh, sometimes uh, chatter on the radio that it's easy to miss your call sign. But when you're connected CPDLC over an ocean, uh, you don't really listen to HF obviously because the HF is very noisy and, and we get the cell call but in a lot of places anyway it's uh, you've got the CPDLC uh, cover so uh, you will be connected on the CPDLC and as I said the CPDLC is great because it makes a ding dong in the flight deck that you cannot uh, really miss so uh, even if you're I don't know playing a game engage in a very deep uh, philosophical conversation with your colleague or a crew member who's coming to visit or anything like that uh, you would not miss the CPDLC call unless I don't know uh, you're totally gone but um, so yeah the CPDLC for that is good so in these conditions when your CPDLC connected over an ocean and there's not much going on you can allow yourself to be a little bit more distracted so to speak but uh, if you see what I mean everybody is human you know got to to be reasonable and but certainly like uh, flying um, over uh, Europe or when you change like sectors every 10 15 minutes sometimes or, or flying over the US uh, or flying uh, over like in anywhere like domestic where there's a lot of uh, traffic where the traffic uh, is quite dense and there's a lot of uh, ATC sectors then you've got to be uh, a little bit more careful so in these circumstances yeah I do agree that you know all the personal devices and stuff uh, personally I don't fly with a personal device I only have my mobile phone uh, but I don't fly with uh, with a personal tablet that actually I uh, pull out in the flight they can do things on so uh, so yeah I don't feel particularly uh, cons concerned about that uh, some guys pull like sometimes a laptop uh, uh, their own personal tablet or whatever uh, but uh, no I know that as I said I don't, uh, I don't use uh, my uh, personal devices I just have my phone with me in my pocket that's it so. uh, 